The question we're going to be addressing uh, today, the question of God, is an interesting question. It's something that's been discussed for centuries, since time immemorial. Theists and atheists discussed this topic back and forth, arguments are shared, arguments for and against the existence of God, and so on and so forth. Right? But the way I want to approach the discussion today is I want to change the narrative. Right? What I want to share is my paradigm, the Islamic paradigm. Right? And from the Islamic perspective, what I want us to realize is that the question of God is not a question. The question of God is not a question. God, Allah, is a reality. Allah is a necessary truth. Allah is axiomatic. The belief in Allah is foundational, it's innate. It's a part of our nature, right? And denying Allah, denying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, denying God is the equivalent of denying ourselves and our very existence. Now you may be thinking, why am I saying this? From the perspective of, if you like, Western philosophy, the term that's used is basic beliefs, right? These, this foundational belief is coined as what's called basic beliefs, right? And we have several basic beliefs. Now I'm going to point out one or two, one being that the real world is the real world. Now this is a foundational basic belief, it's an axiomatic belief. And science, the enterprise of science is based and pegged on this belief itself. The belief that the real world is the real world. Science depends on this, although you cannot empirically validate this claim or belief. Right? Think about this for a second. Try to prove that you're here right now, that you exist, that our surroundings exist. Think about this for a second. Is that real? Now some of you may say, well, the chair I'm sitting on, I can feel the chair I'm sitting on. Some of you may say, well, you know, I can see the auditorium. I can see you standing here talking to me. Some of you may say, well, I can feel my hands and see my hands. But how do you know that what you see and what you feel and what you experience right now is actually real? How do you know it's real? How do you know that you're not just a brain in a vat on a distant planet somewhere and aliens are sticking probes into your brain making you feel like you're here right now? How do you know you're not in a matrix? Think about this. See, the reality is we don't know. We won't know, but the reality is we don't accept these distorted beliefs. We accept that the real world is the real world. We accept that we're here right now. We accept that we're real. And the reason we did this is because it's foundational. It's not arbitrary. It's foundational. It's basic. We need to accept this to move on and progress. And in the same way, what I'm positing is the belief in God is also a foundational belief. It's a basic belief. And the equivalent of denying God is the equivalent of denying that the real world is the real world and that we exist. And this belief, again, it's not arbitrary. This belief is supported first and foremost by the Islamic tradition. And in Islam, we have the concept of what's called the fitra, this innate disposition that Allah has created us upon. This innate knowing, we know Allah exists. We know and we have this innate yearning to worship the divine as well. I mean, all we have to do is look into societies, look into history, civilizations, communities. There have never been entire civilizations or groups of people who have denied the creator. All civilizations have worshipped the divine, worship the supernatural reality. All civilizations throughout history. And what's fascinating is that the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, over 1400 years ago, said that every child is born on the fitra. The fitra, as mentioned before, this innate disposition to recognize Allah and this innate yearning to worship Him. And this is further supported in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So direct your faces towards the religion, incline to truth, adhere to the fitrah of Allah which He has created all people on. Allah has created every single human being on the fitrah. And this is further supported by modern scientific research, empirical data. You have the likes of Justin L. Barrett, who is a developmental scientist and who studied children. He's written several books. In one of such books, in The Born Believers, he's clearly stated that children are born believers of what I call natural religion. We have the likes of Oliver Petrovich, who's also stated the possibility that some religious beliefs are universal, e.g. basic belief in a non-anthropomorphic God as creator of the natural world seems to have a strong empirical foundation, stronger empirical foundation than could be inferred from religious texts. Now this is a scientist. She's citing empirical data, she's citing studies that she's conducted herself and what she's showing is that human beings naturally and rapidly develop the belief in a supreme being, in intelligence. Children naturally and rapidly develop the belief in a creator, in supernatural agencies. And she said that this is more strongly supported empirically than it is through 
religious text. But obviously, if she had studied the Islamic tradition, she would have been aware that it's this concept of the fitrah, this innate belief in Allah, is profound. It's throughout the text. You can't deny this is embedded within the Islamic tradition. Hence, to sum up what I'm saying, basically, is that we believe in Allah first and foremost because it's a part of our fitrah, it's innate. And we're completely justified in believing this. It's a completely rational belief, in the same way, believing that the real world is the real world. Now, some people may say, well, interesting, you know, you, okay, you postulate a basic belief, now let me do the same. Let's bring in the cookie monster. Or let's say a pink purple baboon created everything, right? Someone may say this, but what we need to realize is that basic beliefs aren't just any random beliefs that you can postulate. A basic belief, one, is a foundational belief that other beliefs are based upon. But secondly, a basic belief is also a belief that doesn't require any information transfer. And what do I mean? Let's take a hypothetical scenario. Let's take a group of children and imagine you put a group of children on a desert island. Now they will naturally grow up believing that the world around them is real. It exists. The sand is real, the sea is real, the air is real, the trees are real, the sky is real and so on. They will also naturally and rapidly grow up believing or they will, they will formulate this belief that there are supernatural causal agencies. There is a creator that's created everything and is running and governing everything. But they won't naturally and rapidly develop the belief in a cookie monster or a pink purple baboon. These beliefs will require information transfer. They will require us to understand some things about biscuits, some things about desserts, some things about animals. And these are concepts we will need to know, we need to understand before we can postulate such concepts. But the belief in God and the belief in the real world being the real world, these are innate foundational beliefs. They don't require information transfer. Now some people may say, well, fine, there was loads of other beliefs in the past, basic beliefs, such as the, world, the earth is flat. The earth is flat. This was a, a well-known basic belief that people held. But along came science eventually. We had empirical data which showed that the earth is not flat, it's actually spherical. Hence we let go of the belief, fine. And this is the thing about basic beliefs, if you can provide empirical data against the existence of God or believing that God is innate in the foundational belief, then we can relook or revisit the basic belief and question it. But the irony is that the belief in God is a metaphysical reality beyond the physical. And science is limited to what's physically observable. And we have a problem here, therefore science can never directly prove or disprove the existence of God. The question of God is beyond the scope of science. All science can do, all we can do with the scientific method is infer based on the observations that we have as to which way does science point. Does it point towards God or does it point towards denying God if you like or, believe, or point towards naturalism. This is all science can do. Science can never directly prove or disprove the notion of God. Hence, the basic belief that, that is God can never be challenged from an empirical perspective. And I really wanted to lay down this foundation first because we seem to have developed this notion that we need to reason to God's existence, which is completely flawed. We don't need to, we don't believe in God because we can reason to God's existence. All reasoning and rationality does, or the purpose it serves, is it helps to trigger the fitra, to trigger this innate disposition within us. Amongst those in who it's become clouded or dispersed. And this is what we need to realize, and in this light, I want to continue tonight understanding this and laying down the foundations. And what I want to do today is I want us all to use foundational basic reasoning, what I call functional reasoning, right? I can entertain you with syllogisms, deductive arguments and so on, right? They may be very interesting, you know, a bit of intellectual chess every now and then is not bad for anyone. But the reality is when it comes to truth, truth has to be something all of us can understand. It has to appeal to the masses. I mean, how many people understand complex syllogisms or deductive arguments? The reality is not many, and truth has to be universal. Otherwise, what is, the, what is, the, what is, what is truth which only 2% of the populace understand? It's irrelevant. And I want us to use the reasoning which we use throughout our daily lives, day to day, from when we wake up in the morning, to brushing our teeth, to taking our kids to school, to going to work, returning home, having a dinner and going to bed. The basic reasoning that we use throughout our lives which serves us well. Why is it when it comes to the question of God, that we start to employ this special super criteria. We don't need complex arguments when it comes to God. Our simple functional reasoning serves us well and it does the job and I want us to employ that today because I'm going to discuss a few realities. And what I want us to do 
is question these realities and using functional basic reasoning, ask the question, what best explains these realities? God or naturalism? Or atheism, if you like. Now, the first reality that I want to touch upon and address is our universe and the reality that our universe is rational. It's intelligible. It's governed by distinctive laws, the laws of logic, the laws of physics, and is mathematically coherent. This is a fact which atheists and theist scientists alike would not refute. They would not deny it. Because the, the reality is to do science, another thing science requires, or scientists requires, is that when they make discoveries, they have to be things they can understand. Otherwise, you don't have science. So science is also pegged on the notion that the universe is rational, it's ordered. There's uniformity in nature. Science requires this notion. And even the great scientists or minds of the past, such as Einstein, he said, what is inconceivable about the universe is that it is at all conceivable. Now, he was one of the greatest minds in science. He looked into nature. When he looked into reality, he understood this. He saw that reality is entrenched with reason. It's entrenched with reason. You can't separate the two. And this, this was something that really interested him. Throughout his writings, we see him referring to the rationality present in the universe. And it's because the reality is if we claim or try to maintain naturalism, which is the idea that everything is the result of blind, physical, non-rational processes, on a, if you go down, reduce down to the foundations, everything is the result of blind, random, non-rational, physical processes, gases, molecules bumping into each other, where, however you want to term it. This is the reality according to naturalism. Now, scientists, Einstein, I'm sure, understood this, that if you claim such a thing, then having rationality in our universe doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. Something doesn't add up. We have the likes of uh, more recent scientists, physicists, eminent physicists, such as Paul Davies. In the Templeton Address, he also alluded to this. And he said, and he referred to it as the burning question. He said, he asked the question, he said, where do we get the laws of physics from? Where do we get the laws of physics from? And he followed this up by asking another profound question. He said, how do we have laws which somehow direct these mindless random gases to life, to intelligence, to consciousness? And I really want to emphasize this point. I really want you to understand this point. How can random, blind, non-rational processes, really think about this, basic reasoning, random, blind, random, unconscious processes, they don't have a mind. The dead processes, just physical, just molecules colliding into each other. How can these result into rationality? How can this result into life? How does this result into consciousness? When we employ basic reasoning, we know something doesn't add up. That's not, that's not an inference at all. Naturalism is not an explanation. If anything, it's counter discourse. It doesn't make sense. In the best basic way I can, I can, I can say this or state this is, how do you get rationality from non-rationality? How do you get order from random, blind processes? That's the equivalent of saying something coming from nothing, or something can come from nothing. It's impossible, it's ridiculous. And this is what certain individuals want us to believe. Hocus pocus, literally, magic. It's magic. Take consciousness, for example. Now this state we have as human beings, our awareness, this third person subjective experience that we have, right? This awareness, for example, right now as you're listening to me, you are experiencing listening to me. It makes you feel in a particular way, right? Now what scientists can do is they can hook you up to a monitor and they could correlate the changes in brain function and brain activity as you're listening to me and I say certain things and they can tell you, oh look, there's, been there's these particular changes in this part of the brain and so on. But what they can't do is they cannot quantify that third person subjective experience that you're feeling listening to me or I am feeling listening to you. This is something immaterial, it cannot be quantified by science or empiricism. How do you explain this? Or naturalism? How do you get something immaterial stemming from something material? Again, it's the equivalent of saying something arising from nothing. It's ridiculous. Because if you, all you have is matter in the beginning, and what's going to happen is over time, simple forms of matter are going to arrange into more complex forms of matter. And that's all that's going to happen over time. You're not going to get immaterial realities coming into existence from the material. It doesn't happen. It doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. And 
This is the nature of our universe. And these are important fundamental questions we need to ask. Where do these realities stem from? Naturalism doesn't provide an answer. Naturalism, naturalism doesn't account for a rationally intelligible universe. And you know what? The mystery gets slightly deeper. Because not only is the universe rational, but we're rational beings. We have the ability to understand the universe. How amazing is that? It's almost like a lock and a key. The lock being the universe in all of its glory and majesty, and the key being the human mind, which has the capacity of high level thought. And it has the ability to unlock some of the secrets of the universe. It's almost like we've been placed here to discover. And what I'm going to show you, inshallah, in, uh, very shortly is that from the Islamic perspective, we can draw a beautiful inference to these realities. But before I do that, I just want to quote uh, another eminent physicist and mathematician, John Barrow, John D. Barrow. He alluded to the rationality of human beings and he st stated, natural selection requires no understanding of quarks and black holes for survival and multiplication. No understanding. Survival isn't concerned with understanding the universe or doing mathematics. Animals survive. Cockroaches survive. I mean, if, you have, if any of you have had an infestation of cockroaches, you know how well they survive and how rapidly they multiply. They, leave, they put us to shame. But when was the last time you saw a group of cockroaches sitting over coffee discussing quantum mechanics? It doesn't happen. So survivability and discovery are two distinct things. They're not linked. Again, naturalis naturalism plus evolution and natural selection do not explain our rational faculties, our higher level thought. But from the Islamic perspective, we have a beautiful inference, an amazing inference. Because in the Quran, as mentioned before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, seldom does he try to prove his existence. Seldom does he do that, because Allah is a self-evident truth. He's necessary. Instead, what God does is he takes us from his existence to his worship. He takes us from his existence to his worship. And one of the strategies that God employs is he tells us to look into his creation. He tells us to look into the physical reality. Because when we do this, we will see his majesty, we would see his creative power. And being rational beings that he's made us, we would then realize how great he is and how insignificant we are, we would naturally submit to him in worship. For example, God says in the third chapter of the Quran, verse 190, Indeed, verily, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the alternation of the night and day, in it are signs for those of understanding. Signs for those of understanding. God further says in the Quran, we will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves until it becomes clear, manifest to them that it is the truth referring to the Quran. God is telling us to observe the physical reality and this is exactly what we see when we look into reality. We see order. We see the signs. We see the laws, distinctive laws that are present. We see mathematics. We see geometry. We see all of these amazing things. And we have the rational faculties to do this. This is a blessing. This, I would argue, I would go further this is one of the greatest acts of mercy. Because taking into consideration how insignificant we are, an insignificant dot on an insignificant blue planet which we call Earth, which is insignificant in comparison to our solar system, which is insignificant in comparison to our galaxy, which our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, which itself is insignificant compared to all the other galaxies. Look how insignificant we are. Being so insignificant, God has given us a rational, rational, intelligible universe and he's given us the ability to understand this universe, to see the majesty of this universe. This is one of the greatest acts of mercy. And mercy is not the attribute of a deistic mechanical cause. Mercy is the attribute of a personal being, a great intelligence. And the amazing thing is in the Quran, I mean, every, almost every chapter starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, loosely translated. We have an entire chapter which is called Surah Rahman. And continuously God repetitively asks the question, which of the favors of your Lord will you deny? Think about this, basic reasoning. This is one of the greatest favors amongst all of the life we see present on this planet. The animals, the insects, and the monkeys, we are the only beings which have the ability to discover and understand the universe and do science. Something fascinating. And I would argue not only is God the best explanation for the intelligibility of the universe and our rational state, our ability to reason in high level thought, but Islam has the best inference to this reality. Now, 
I mean, these realities don't end. I was, I'll just quickly share another amazing reality, which is the reality of information. Now, information is something fascinating as well. Because we live in a world which is full of information, right? But information itself is something which is immaterial. It has no material substance. It has material carriers, but it has itself no material substance. For example, I'm communicating information to you right now, right? But there is no physical transfer from me to you. You can take this information and go and communicate it to someone else. Again, there won't be any physical transfer. So you've given them information, being the material carrier, but you haven't given them something physical. So it, rises, it raises another question, which is first, where did you get information from? This entity we call information. Not only this, if we push this a little further, we think about this. See, let's take something basic, like a basic form of information. As we can see, the, the title there, the God question, right? Basic sentence comprised of about three words. Yeah, about, I don't know, about 10 to 15 let letters, right? Now, when we look at this, we know that there is, obviously, it's, it's via a computer program, you've been able to type up these letters, but this physical reality we see here contains something non-material, immaterial, which is information. We can perceive this information. We could read the sentence. Now, if you guys were to walk in, and I said to you that this somehow typed itself up at random by chance. How many of you would believe me? No one. Because you know as soon as you see that as basic as this is, as basic of an arrangement this is, although it's specified, it spells a particular, it's not just random letters, it's specified information. As basic as it is, you would infer an intelligence. Straight away. And again, basic reasoning, functional reasoning. Yes, you're right. There was someone who typed that up. Uh, archaeologists, when he goes into caves, and they go into caves and they look at cave drawings, they can see something far more simpler than this, trivial than this, something just as, as, as less as four lines and a couple of dots, and they would infer intelligence. But the amazing or the ironical thing is that when we go into or look into the human genome, which is the, human, the DNA, it is comprised of anywhere between 2.8 to 3.5 billion base pairs consisting of a chemical alphabet, A, T, C, and G. Precisely sequenced, not random sequencing, precisely sequenced to carry out a particular function, which is obviously the creation of proteins and so on. But when we look at five or six letters, we say intelligence, somebody typed that up. Ridiculous, no, it can't just appear by itself. But when we look at the human genome and the information present there and how complex it is, 3.5 billion base pairs, or oh, almost, if you like, another way to phrase it is a sentence consisting of 3.5 billion letters. We say chance, necessity, or a combination of the two. Hocus pocus. Literally, magic. We've been led to believe in magic. This, this is the sad reality. It's almost as if people want us to let go of the blessing which is our rational faculties given by God. This functional reasoning which works. And they want us to engage in some sort of twisted intellectual chess, so somehow we arrive at the conclusion that something as complex as, complex as that has arisen by chance of necessity, but something as simple as that, no, there has to be someone who put that there. No consistency. There's literally no consistency. It's a joke. It's a joke. And we need to really look into these realities and ask the question, what best explains it? And again, in this situation, God, Allah is the best explanation. He is the creator. He created everything and He created information. It's that simple. Now, to conclude, what I want to do briefly is try to give you something, if you like, in a, in a nicely tied package. Something you could take away and think about, right? And engage with it intellectually in your own minds. And inshallah, I hope and I pray that this will really engage your fitra as well and awaken it. And what I want to do is talk about, try summing up all of this reality for you. The things we've discussed and the things we haven't been able to discuss due to the limitations of time. Now about, and picture this, go along with me if you, if you will. About 14 billion years ago, according to some estimates of science, the universe came into existence. Our entire universe came into existence. Now what's interesting is that this universe was not just random, it was ordered. This universe was governed by distinctive laws, the laws of logic, the laws of mathematics, the laws of science and physics and so on. This universe was precisely fine-tuned. There were certain constants and quantities which fell into a very, very, very narrow range of life permitting values. Not only this, about 4 billion years ago, according to some estimates, give or take, 
a planet emerges in the solar system, what we call the Earth. And this planet falls into a precise zone, what scientists call the Goldilocks zone. Not too close to the sun and not too far from the sun. We, we see the results of that with, with the other planets in our solar system. Any closer, you see what happens. Any further away, you see what happens. This planet, not only does it emerge in this precise space, it also has a precise atmosphere. This planet also has a precise sized moon. On this planet, about, I don't know, 3.5 billion years, and I'm, I'm, I'm just throwing out numbers now, but on this planet, around that time, life emerges, somehow. Life emerges. This life contains information. Not only this, somehow, a little while later, human beings emerge. And these human beings have the ability to understand this universe, to understand the intelligibility of the universe, to ponder over the fine-tuning of this universe. These human beings are not only rational, they're alive, they have intelligence, they're moral beings, they're conscious beings. If you want to claim all of this, everything is a result of blind, random, physical, dead processes, just molecules colliding into each other, then go ahead. Go ahead and do that. But realize that you're not fooling anybody except yourself. And I urge you and I leave you with this, really awaken your fitrah, awaken your intellects, look into reality, read the Qur'an, because when you read it, the Qur'an is a book that really gets you to think. Continuously, God asks you to think and to ponder and look into creation. Use basic reasoning, functional reasoning which works. And inshallah, I pray, may God awaken all of our fitrah and lead us to the truth. I thank you for listening.